The Grand Canyon is a breathtaking wonder, but when the sun falls and you're trapped in the darkness within those canyon walls, where will you go when mythical monsters come out beginning to hunt? Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for a free wicked 4K werewolf wallpaper, courtesy of yours truly. Today I've got an assortment of tales featuring werewolves, naughty demons, and horrible curses. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your scariest experiences with the unexplained at darkstories.org if you want to hear your story on this show. Also, check out eeriecast.com for more scary shows like this and to shop our store. Now, let's begin. Dogman in Israel from Sabrine. I'm from Israel. There aren't many woods here like in the USA. However, my encounter happened in an area called Ein Hushufit, which is an open meadow surrounded by a thick forest with tall pine trees. My family and I were traveling there on a sunny day. At the time, I was 20 years old, unmarried, and had no kids. After finishing our lamb barbecue lunch, a famous cultural meal to have on outings in Israel. I decided to take a walk on a trail located just across from where my family was sitting. The weather was amazing, and I was enjoying my walk so much that I didn't notice I'd gone a little too far from my family and the other people in the area. The first thing that snapped me out of my haze was that the birds chirping in sounds of nature suddenly disappeared. They didn't fade away slowly either. They just stopped as if someone pressed the off button. I considered that even though I didn't have food with me, maybe the smell of barbecue might have stuck to me. At the moment, I didn't have any weapons on me. I decided to turn around and walk back, feeling like I was being watched the whole time. In Israel, there are no bears, cougars, wolves, or any large predators. The most you might come across is a coyote or a stray dog, which usually wouldn't scare me. But this time... I felt there was a threat. I began to scan the tree line on one side and the tall grass on the other. Slowly looking around, I saw a hand on one of the trees. It was human-like, like a very hairy man's hand. It had long fingers with black claws holding on to the tree. I followed the hand down to see a crouching figure. It was sideways, not directly facing me, and it was brownish red, blending in with the trees. It sat so still, its German Shepherd-like head focused on something. It seemed to not notice me, thankfully, but I tried to make out the rest of the body behind a small bush. Its ears were longer than a dog's or a wolf's, and the eyes looked like a cat's eyes from the side with a round lens-like appearance. Those eyes were big, but I couldn't see the color. Suddenly, it twitched its ear and turned its head back to look at me. And I gasped. It seems I scared it too, because it stood up on its hind legs, turned around, and dashed off into the woods. In that moment, I managed to take a quick look at its body. It had a lean body, not too muscular, but still looking like someone who worked out. The eyes were really big and went sideways like a fox or a wolf's, but bigger and pure yellow toned. The fur was pretty thin, not shaggy, more like a Doberman's. When it turned around, I saw a bushy tail. It was so quick, it looked like a brown blur passing by, and it made no sound at all. There was no funny smell like most people might notice, nothing else out of the ordinary, and that's what scared me. This creature was so super quiet, it could have been stalking me without me ever noticing. So there's my encounter. What do you think it was? Werewolf of the Grand Canyon From Reese Earther I still remember how excited I was when I got picked for that wildlife research project in the Grand Canyon a few years back. I had just finished my biology degree, so getting hands-on experience tracking coyotes seemed like an amazing opportunity. My two teammates, Eric and Wendy, felt the same way. 
we were all eager science nerds ready for adventure. When we arrived in Arizona and met our park ranger guide, he warned us that spending two weeks camping deep in the canyon wasn't for the faint of heart. The remoteness meant we'd be on our own if any emergencies happened to come up. But we assured him we were up to the task. We set off on the long trek down, lugging all our camping gear and research equipment. On the first evening, we found a secluded site off the main trails to set up our base camp. It took over an hour to get the tents pitched and our supplies organized as dusk fell over the canyon walls surrounding us. We were all tired from the hike in, so after a quick dinner, we turned in early. The night was calm and surprisingly quiet, just the occasional hoot of an owl or rustle in the bushes. Nothing alarming. I remember falling asleep fast, worn out from the day's exertions. Sometime later, I woke up to strange noises right outside my tent. At first, I thought it was just a raccoon or a coyote sniffing around our food bags. But when I quietly peeked out the tent flap, I couldn't see any animals. The moonlight only revealed the rocky canyon terrain. The grunting and odd sniffing sounds faded away, so I assumed it was nothing. I settled back down and quickly dozed off again. I was startled awake again later that night by the sound of heavy footsteps tramping around the campsite. The crunching gravel and twigs snapping underfoot were unmistakable. I quickly unzipped the tent flap again, peering outside. In the dim moonlight, I couldn't see anything, but the footsteps continued pacing in a circle around us. I woke up Eric and Wendy to make sure they heard it too. There's something big walking around out there, I whispered loudly. Eric mumbled it was probably just a curious coyote wandering near the food bags, as I had previously suspected. The footsteps did sound too loud and heavy for a coyote, though. We all stayed silent, listening to whatever was outside, methodically making its way around the tents. The footsteps halted right outside. Then we heard loud sniffing, like some huge animal inhaling and catching our scents. I don't think a coyote would be so bold. I was frozen wondering if I should yell to scare it off. Suddenly, a low, guttural growl rumbled just outside the tent fabric. It sounded like a bear's growl, but deeper, more throaty. We all exchanged panicked looks in the darkness. This was definitely no coyote. I stumbled to grab my flashlight while Wendy found the bear spray. As I fumbled to turn on the flashlight, something heavy pressed against the tent Sharp claws began to violently scratch at the fabric right near my face, shredding holes in the nylon. I fell backwards in terror. We yelled at the top of our lungs, hoping to startle whatever beast was attacking our shelter. The scratching ceased as our shouts echoed off the canyon walls. But before we could sigh in relief, the entire tent started to shake violently. Something was grabbing the roof now thrashing it back and forth with incredible force. Eric, Wendy, and I screamed as loud as we could, pointing our flashlights all over the place. Suddenly, the assault stopped, and in the flashlight beams, we saw a large, shadowy figure scampering away from the mangled tent entrance. My hands trembled uncontrollably as the three of us scanned our surroundings with the lights but the beams of light only caught empty terrain. Whatever had stalked our camp was gone as quickly as it came. We huddled together, listening intently for any sign it had returned. But the night was silent once again. None of us dared leave the shredded tent to investigate further. Exhausted and horrified, we eventually fell into a fitful sleep again, hoping the creature was gone for good but the next morning would bring a whole new level of fear and confusion. When morning sunlight finally filtered into the ravaged tent, we debated whether we should step outside to assess the damage. That thing could still be lurking nearby, waiting for us to emerge. But we knew we couldn't hide in the tent forever. After hearing no sounds for several minutes, I slowly unzipped the flap, rather what was left of it. The three of us cautiously stepped out together 
bear spray and flashlights raised. We swept through the campsite, bathed in harsh morning light, searching for any sign of that creature. The camp area looked utterly trampled, with torn up dirt, scattered equipment, and scratches gouged into the ground. Large, unfamiliar prints we couldn't identify marred the landscape. But we saw no beast in sight. The area reeked of a strange, musky odor that I couldn't place. Whatever had attacked us was massive and powerful. Definitely no coyote, and probably not a mountain lion. Eric wanted to just pack up and hike back to the rim immediately, but the researcher in me needed to examine the prints and damage while it was all still fresh. What exactly had we heard and seen in the dark? Wendy offered to stand watch with the bear spray while Eric and I followed the prints. They led right up to my mangled tent entrance before disappearing into the bushes. I paused there, shining my light on the flattened brush. Something caught my eye. Several clumps of thick, grayish hair snagged on the shrub stems. Without a word, I pointed at the hair, meeting Eric's equally alarmed gaze. We clicked off our flashlights as the sun climbed higher into the sky. We then backtracked out of the brush, deciding we'd seen enough. The campsite needed to be vacated now. I couldn't believe we'd come face to face with something so enormous and strong and unknown. A coyote or a cougar just did not match the havoc and prints we'd found. The footprints didn't resemble a bear's either. All I knew for certain was that we needed to get out of the canyon. The sun continued to rise over the canyon rim, but we already had our backpacks loaded up to hike out. None of us felt safe staying another second. As we rapidly took down what remained of the ravaged campsite, the surrounding wilderness remained eerily silent. No bird calls or scampering wildlife sounds that you'd normally expect at dawn. Just tense and heavy quiet. Once we were all set, we cautiously followed the bizarre tracks back into the woods, attempting to glimpse where the creature had gone. But the jumbled prints disappeared just 20 yards in, with no trace of our nighttime stalker. Had it left the area? Or was it camouflaged and waiting unseen in the shadows? We couldn't shake the feeling its eyes still followed us, despite no evidence of it nearby. I nervously eyed each shrub and thicket as we hastened through the brush. My imagination conjured up the beast crouching behind every rock and tree, but there was nothing there when I looked. Though we found no other trace of it so far, we still needed to leave. Sure, it sucked, not knowing where our stalker might be, but we didn't really have another choice. We swiftly headed back up canyon, away from the creature's domain, or so we thought. Miles of strenuous hiking passed in tense silence. No one wanted to acknowledge just how close we'd come to being torn apart in our sleep. I kept glancing back behind us, certain each rustling bush or scurrying lizard was our pursuer, returning, but the canyon remained empty and still. Finally, we emerged sweat-soaked and exhausted back at the populated canyon rim where we'd started. As we gave statements to the puzzled rangers, I noticed Eric and Wendy avoiding mentions of anything besides a rogue bear harassing us. Maybe they thought it sounded insane. Maybe they feared we'd be ridiculed. But I just couldn't shake the certainty that we'd escaped something frightening, something unknown in those canyon woods. And if there was a next time, we might not get away unscathed. Back at our Arizona motel that evening, I still felt rattled and unnerved. Eric and Wendy seemed ready to forget the whole ordeal and enjoy the hotel amenities, but I couldn't get the image of that giant creature out of my mind. We'd escaped something extraordinary. So I pressed the park rangers around there for any other reports of something bipedal and wolf-like roaming the inner canyon, but they laughed it off. Must have been a curious bear, they insisted. Part of me wondered if they knew more than they let on. Perhaps they ignored the weird and frightening in their park. But mostly, the rangers seemed oblivious. With no definitive explanation from the experts, I turned to the internet to research what we might have seen. Massive prints, gray hair, heavy musky smell, and hunched bipedal movement. These sounded like traits ascribed to mythic creatures like werewolves or dogmen. 
I dove deep into the old Native American legends about skinwalkers that supposedly still lurked in remote areas. But were they real? The logical part of my mind resisted belief in paranormal creatures stalking moonlit forests. But when I recalled that trembling shadow receding from our flashlight beams, my logic failed. Something had been watching us. Something that walked on two legs and left Prince no coyote could. Its yellow eyes were seared into my memory. In the following weeks, the questions gnawed at me, even as we wrote our sober scientific reports, omitting that fateful night. Had some local legend come to life under the full moon? Was there any validity to the tales of beasts lurking in overlooked places in the wild? I'm not sure if we truly stumbled on a monster, or just an odd wolf of some sort but I'll never set foot in those Grand Canyon woods again, that's for sure. Whatever roamed there wasn't meant to be seen by human eyes. Our flashlights might be the only things that saved us that night. Our Manor, from Clemens K. I lived in the Limpopo province of South Africa, in the capital city of Polo Kwani for about 17 years of my life, before moving to Bloemfontein, one of South Africa's three capital cities. The Limpopo province is known for witchcraft and Sangomas, witch doctors, and many people still go to them for spiritual rituals and other things that I'm not so familiar with. I've heard countless stories about snakes coming out of eggs and goat's heads appearing in pots in people's houses without anyone even entering the house well, this happened about 10 years ago, when I was 10 years old. We lived in my mom and dad's dream house they spent four years building. It was a magical place with six rooms, seven bathrooms, a library, wine cellar, bar, and office. It had four garages, and one of them was turned into my dad's man cave, where he built his model wooden ships. It was truly a spectacular house. We lived in the house for about a month, when my mom and dad began to work on the outdoor entertainment area where they built guest bathrooms. That's when we discovered witch doctor equipment, like bowls used to crush ingredients and some bones of animals, along with some jewelry. Some of the workers wanted to give it to their witch doctors as gifts, and my dad told them they could, as he really didn't mind it. It was only after the entertainment area was finished about a month or two later that strange things started to happen. One of the first things was that the maids began finding snakes in our rooms. We thought this was normal since the house was built a while out of town in the bush. Then other things happened. One of the first major incidents was in our kitchen, where we started to hear someone walking around and the alarm would go off. I distinctly remember one night when my mom was scared. She came to fetch us from our rooms to take us to the main bedroom because my dad and mom had heard multiple people running around the house. I saw fear for the first time in my mom and dad. That was one of the scariest nights of my life. I always felt as if I was being watched there, no matter where I was. All of us had constant nightmares, and it got so bad, my mom and dad moved two beds into the master bedroom for me and my little brother to sleep in due to how frequent our nightmares were. It was so bad that my two teenage sisters, 15 and 17 at the time, shared a room. My 17-year-old sister was a teen mom, and her baby at the time was about three months old. She had a dream of an old woman dressed as a witch doctor, picking up the baby who was sleeping next to her in his crib. The dream was so disturbing that she woke up. When she was awake, she saw her three-month-old baby in the middle of the floor, screaming and crying as if he'd been hurt. But the worst thing happened when my mom and 15-year-old sister went to Pretoria with my grandpa after he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. They had to go to a psychiatric hospital to admit him for 21 days. While they were away, we all slept in the master bedroom. My brother on the double bed with me, my sister with her baby on the other double bed, and my dad in his bed. At three in the morning, the house alarm went off. We were all awake by the time my dad turned off the alarm. Then we heard footsteps running up and down the wooden stairs. I remember grabbing my sister and hugging her, scared to death. 
As it went silent, we heard a scream from the bottom of the stairs. Then we heard something running up the stairs across the hall and into the other half of the house. My dad took his gun, going to see if it was a burglar or someone else. As he inspected all of our rooms, he saw people sleeping in all of our beds. He told us when he went into my sister's room, he smelled rotting flesh and saw an old lady dressed as a singoma lying in my sister's bed. He slammed the door, ran to us, closed the master bedroom's door, and told us to go back to bed. We sold that house not long after to a Canadian businessman who owned a couple of businesses in Polo Kwani. That was one of the worst years of my life. Don't Trail Ride at Night From Cassie, 1988 This story happened when I was a teen and has always haunted me. I was never sure what I'd seen, but I knew that it wasn't normal. I've never spoken of it until now. After listening to this podcast, I figured out what it might be. I would also like to say that the horse in this story held a very special place in my heart, and still does. She protected me that night, and I'll never forget it. I believe what I encountered that night was a windigo, but you be the judge. Here's my story. I grew up in a small town in northern British Columbia that is known for its rivers and lakes and other outdoor recreational activities. Since I was very little, my family has always had horses, which meant that we spent a lot of time exploring the trails around the town. These included the cross-country ski trails that were located just outside of town. My family and family friends enjoyed camping at the ski trails since they had a nice covered area, and the lake was right there to swim and kayak on. We'd been there a bunch of times before without incident. On this particular weekend, a very large group of us decided to spend the weekend camping and trail riding. We arrived early in the afternoon around noon and set up camp, then went on a trail ride. The forest at the time was beautiful and peaceful. We found a few trails that connected to take us around the lake and just enjoyed the ride. There was nothing out of the ordinary. Once that ride was over, we set to making dinner and getting ready for the evening. Around 6 p.m., D and F showed up, having gotten off of work. They were sad that they had missed the ride. None of the adults wanted to go again, so I said that I would take them around, because I knew the trail. So I saddled back up and they joined me. We left camp around 7 p.m. Now I should note here that in Canada, in the summer, it doesn't get dark until around 10 p.m., so we thought we had plenty of light left for the ride. We started down the trail and everything seemed normal, so I thought nothing of it. We'd been on the trail for about half an hour when my horse started to act up. She began to snort and flag her tail like she was scared of something. I kept my head on a swivel, watching for anything in the woods that might be scaring her. It was a little farther down the trail when I realized something was off. It was too quiet, and we were the only ones making noise. I also had this gut feeling that we were being watched. At first, I thought it was probably just a bear, which had possibly chased away all the life around us. But then I got this awful feeling of dread, like a Dementor from Harry Potter was affecting me, like a feeling I was never going to be happy again. It was so strange. It took us about an hour and a half to get to the top of the trail, which overlooked the lake. It was a beautiful spot, and D and F wanted to stop and take pictures. We got off the horses then and took some photos. It was starting to get dark, so we didn't stay long. But during the photo session, the wind picked up and we got hit with this horrible smell. The scent was like rotting flesh and garbage. I swallowed hard then, thinking that we'd stumbled across a kill that a bear had left behind. That's when my horse snorted again flagging her tail and stomping at the ground hard, acting even more scared than before. I looked around the forest, just waiting for something to jump out at us when I saw them. There in the trees about eight feet off the ground was a set of yellow eyes looking right at me. I shivered and stayed transfixed on the eyes. 
I was sure it was my imagination playing tricks on me until I saw it breathe. I took a deep breath and said, Guys, I think we need to leave. The two of them nodded, not seeing the eyes in the trees. We continued down the trail. I kept looking behind me, hoping that whatever I saw was just in my head. But it wasn't. I still had the feeling of being watched, and that horrible stench followed us down the trail. I knew we were still a long way from the camp, probably an hour or more. I kept my head on a swivel, hoping that whatever was following us stayed back there in the trees. By the time we reached the main leg of the ski trails, it was way past 10 p.m., and the sun had set. The horses had all started to act up near the end of the trail before we hit the main line. It was actually starting to scare me. We had just crested a small hill on the main line when I heard the trees cracking behind me. I swallowed hard, daring to turn around, hoping and praying that it was just a moose. Unfortunately, that wasn't it. What I saw standing in the middle of the trail is something I can only describe as death. It was tall and lanky, almost like its limbs were too long for its body. It stood on two legs and had the head of a deer with sharp canine teeth and human-like back teeth. Its yellow eyes were sunk into its head. I almost froze there, terrified, but I felt in my bones that this thing was dangerous. I screamed at D&F to run. They turned around, and I saw their faces go white. The horses they were on took off into the night, and mine soon followed. I put one hand as far up her neck to give her as much room to stretch out and run as I could. I heard the thing screech, then I heard thudding footsteps behind me, and I tried to kick my horse into an even faster pace. I could hear the creature getting closer and closer to us, and I screamed at the boys to keep kicking and to not look back. I soon felt a presence beside me, so I looked over, only to see the creature right there, running along with me. I panicked, trying to position myself away from it, but I didn't want to come off my horse. What happened next solidified that my horse was truly my best friend in the whole world. As we ran, I saw the thing try and grab me, and just as it was about to grab my arm, my mare pinned her ears and turned her head with her teeth bared. She grabbed onto the creature's arm, pulling it forward in front of us and knocking it to the ground. She jumped over the thing as it tumbled, and when we landed, she gave it a good kick to the head. I could even hear her hoof connect with the bones, and I cringed for it. We made it back to camp shortly after, and everyone had their flashlights out getting ready to come look for us. We told them what we'd seen, that we wanted to pack up and leave now. Of course, no one believed us, saying we mistook it for a deer or other animal, but we convinced them to pack up anyway. I hardly slept that night. It all felt like some really bad nightmare. The following morning, I went out to grab my mare to go for a ride, still hoping it was just a nightmare, only to find she had blood in her mouth and on her lip from the bite she gave that creature. Plus, there were marks on her legs from the claws trying to rake at her. I hugged her neck and pulled her close to me. She'd been the reason that I made it out alive that night. To all of you out there who trail ride in the forest, be super careful at night. We Suffer a Family Curse From Sierra G I'm aware people may not believe this, but that's fine. I know what my family and I experienced throughout those years. For the first half of my life, my family lived in haunted homes. At this point, I honestly don't know whether we were the haunted ones or the locations themselves were haunted. All I can confirm is that all my life until recently, no matter where I lived, I never felt alone, even when I was the only person in the room. Perhaps it's due to the alleged curse on my family, or mere coincidence, who can really say. But here's my long story of my family's misfortune. My grandfather on my dad's side came from Spain, my grandmother from Mexico. However, they moved to America and got married, 
having several daughters, my father and my uncle. I haven't met all my aunts since I was young, so that's why I'm unsure of the exact amount of aunts I have. The story goes that somewhere after that, my grandma made a friend who was a bruja, a Mexican witch. They were friends for many years, and she would at some point have my grandmother aid her in her practices. This eventually led to all my aunts getting involved too. I'm not sure on what all they did, as no one likes to speak on it too often, and I'm not saying everyone who practices will cause things like this, but I do know that after a few years of helping this woman, things got dark. One day, my aunts were in a room doing a spell of sorts, and their room door slammed shut. My father says they then heard all the girls screaming, so they ran in to help. But even with the force of my dad, his brother, and my grandfather, both of whom played football and were very strong, they could not get through the door, even by throwing all their weight into it. This was not a heavy-duty door. It was one of those thin, cheap, wooden doors. The boys kept trying their hardest as the screaming persisted. The girls said some sort of portal opened in that room, and one of my aunts was dragged across the room and under the bed towards it. Eventually, the boys made it inside, and everything stopped. But this was supposedly when my grandma had enough. She told the woman she would not be helping her anymore. This made the woman mad, and she told my grandma she would regret this decision, that she would curse our family. My grandma never helped that woman again, cutting off their friendship entirely. However, things did start to go wrong for my family after that, coming across much misfortune and terrifying experiences. I myself have experienced many things. I do believe the curse, though there is speculation on what exactly the curse is. Bad luck? Something dark attached to our name? All I know is that it's bad. Fast forward to my father marrying my mother and having us four kids. I'm told our family was always surrounded by negative energy and paranormal happenings. My mom has told me how when my oldest sister was a baby, she once heard whispering from her crib. She couldn't make it all out, but she heard a man and woman's voice say they wanted her. She called psychics who told her there was something following my family, which was attached to my father, sister, and eventually us three kids. My mom told me about when I was a baby, I was sitting in the living room watching TV, playing with blocks when paranormal activity began to happen. Things began to spin, being thrown, and my mom shouted, What do you want? That's when a glass flower vase broke and a chunk of glass shot towards me, hitting the floor right when it reached my foot. I remember when I got a little older, I was sitting in the hallway playing with marbles as my mom gave my baby sister a bath. One of my marbles rolled into my sister's room. I was confused, as I hadn't touched it. Then I heard my big sister's voice tell me to come here. I peeked my head in her room, and I couldn't see her. I giggled and said, where are you? I swear I heard her answer. Over here. My marble then rolled out from under her bed. My mom came up behind me then, asking who I was talking to. I told her my older sister, and her eyes widened. Honey, she said, your sister's at school. After that, she forced me to sit in the bathroom with her while she did my baby sister's hair. Things definitely escalated after my baby brother was born, and we moved from our small town into an even smaller town nearby. To this day, things that happened in that house haunt me. At first, us kids would see what we called shadow people, often seeing dark figures dart into the rooms. Then they started to interact with us. One time, my little sister and I were playing with our toys in the bathroom when I remember seeing a tall shadow peek into the doorway. We shrieked at the top of our lungs. Dad and Mom came running in as the figure flew down the hall into our room, slamming the door behind it. A few days after that, our little brother started to scream bloody murder in the middle of the night. When we ran into our parents' room to see what the heck was going on, we found our parents holding him as he sobbed, fighting to climb into our dad's arms, refusing to look at our mom. 
He kept saying, Scary Mommy. We were all frightened and confused. When he finally calmed down, they asked what happened, and he said, Mommy was crawling on the wall above me. She opened her mouth and blood came out. She tried to get me. Naturally, we were all terrified, and it took a lot of convincing for my mom to get him to look at her, so she could explain that that wasn't really her, that she would never do that to him. I'll admit at first I thought he just had a really scary nightmare, until a few days later when my little sister, my baby brother, and I were in my parents' room on their bed, pretending to be wrestlers for WWE. At one point, my sister jumped on me as we pretended to fight, when my brother started to scream and cry. We thought we heard him, until he started to scream, Scary Mommy. We panicked and looked at where he was pointing. I swear I saw a figure leaving the room from the ceiling as my dad came in to yet again see what he was crying about. He saw her many times after that, always calling whatever that thing or entity was, Scary Mommy. Things continued from then on. I'd often hear my dad or grandpa calling me into the laundry room, even when I knew for a fact they weren't in there. Waking in the night, I would hear my name being called or see figures go into my closet, often hearing doors slam when we refused to follow the voices. It was a never-ending cycle, and just as you thought you were getting used to things, they would get worse. One day, when my oldest sister and my little brother were having breakfast, they said they saw a scary-looking pale green lizard man clutching the wall with his tongue out, watching them as they both froze in fear, not even knowing how to react at that point. Even after moving from that house, activity continued. One year when our parents left town to go Christmas shopping, because there weren't any big stores in our small town, they left us with our big sister. We all slept in the same room because we were aware that being alone was a bad idea. But that night, I woke to the sound of banging. I sat up and saw my big sister staring at the door, which was visibly moving as the banging noise continued. My heart raced as my two younger siblings woke to the sound, too. The lights flickered as we began to cry. The room door opened and slammed shut. My sister tried calling our parents, but there was no answer. The banging went on for at least two hours without letting up, and we all heard different things. I heard my big sister call me into her room, which made no sense because she was right beside me. Eventually, the noise finally stopped, and we sat in silence, unsure of what was going to happen next. Suddenly, we heard the front door open and close. We thought our parents were finally home, so we all jumped up and booked it out of the room. But the entire house was still dark. We went downstairs calling for mom and dad, but they weren't home. The TV in the living room then flickered on and off. We heard the door upstairs start to bang again. I couldn't stop crying. Our sister tried calling them over and over but still got no answer. Then things got quiet. My brother wanted to watch some Scooby-Doo, so we tried turning on the TV for him, but it kept shutting off along with all the other lights. This felt like it went on for ages. We all huddled on the couch, crying in the dark, until our parents actually walked through the door, confused why we were all sitting there in the dark. We ran over and hugged them, telling them what happened, and from then on, any time they went shopping, we went with them. About a year after that, our parents got a divorce, and for my mom, things stopped. But for us, they continued. I started to see a dark figure with a hat randomly appearing, no matter where I was. I've had dreams of that figure telling me they were coming for me, and I still heard voices of people that were not there. My older sister woke up to a weight on her chest. When she opened her eyes, she saw a blue woman with dark hair snarling at her. She couldn't move until she closed her eyes again, relaxing her mind and tried to roll over. The entity just lifted off of her. My dad woke up one night to feelings of being choked with something hitting his chest. One time I felt so entirely drained I couldn't get out of bed all day. Then that night, 
I woke up standing in front of an open window in my sister's room of our second floor apartment, having no idea how I got there. I'm just lucky I woke up, I suppose. For the most part, things have calmed down regarding the paranormal aspects of my life. I'm 21. I've researched ways to protect myself from things of that nature. I sleep better at night, perhaps due to the constant protection spells, sleep spells, and cleansings that I now do in my daily life. Or maybe it's something else, who knows. You can believe what you want, it's your choice. Just be careful who you cross. For me, witchcraft is real. Spirits, the paranormal, the unexplained, cryptids, legends, curses, it's all real. So next time someone tells you a scary experience they had, don't laugh. Have some sympathy. They could be surviving a curse. Warning. The following story contains depictions of harm against animals. A Bigfoot attacked my truck. From Danny Joe. This story was told to me by my grandfather, who was a semi-driver for 20 years, and my dad validated it. I'm going to tell it like he told it to me, from his point of view. It was 1987, early fall on a Montana highway. I was transporting live pigs from one farm to another. Late into the night, around 11 p.m., I decided to stop and get some shut-eye, so I found a small runoff on the road. After walking around my semi and trailer to make sure everything was locked down and secure, I got back up in the cab and finally went to sleep. Around 3 a.m., I was awakened by the harsh squealing of the pigs. I jumped up, startled, and hopped out of the truck to check on what was going on. When I got around to the back of the trailer, I saw some blood on the ground and a bit of flesh. I was very uneasy because I didn't understand what was happening. At that moment, I heard something behind me. It sounded like an incredibly low-toned growl. This made my skin crawl, so I began to make my way back to the front. As I got to the front, I got back in the truck and decided to go ahead and leave. There was no way I was going to be able to go back to sleep after that. I drove for about two more hours before coming to a truck stop. The sun was finally making its way up, so I would finally be able to get a good look at what happened with the trailer to see what was going on. Looking at the trailer then, I noticed one of the pigs was dead from what looked to be a huge cut, causing way too much blood loss. Instantly, I was concerned about what was trying to get into the trailer. Another driver came over, asking what happened. I replied, I've got no idea. What do you make of it? The guy looked over the whole thing, then got really close to the trailer and started to grab something. What are you doing? I asked. He looked up and showed me what he found. Well, what do you make of this? He said, lifting his hand, holding a large, dark form. It looked like a black claw. Goosebumps popped up over my whole body, and I didn't know what to say or think at the moment. He gave me the claw and told me to stay on the road. Apparently, he had heard stories of truckers going missing on the same stretch of road I'd come from. I went ahead and filled up on fuel, then made my way to the drop-off. As I got to my destination, which was a small farm, I backed up the load to the barn doors and went to talk to the farmer. He greeted me outside the barn doors with a confused look. He spoke up and asked, What happened? You were supposed to be here an hour ago. I was hesitant to tell him why, but I went ahead. You see, something happened on the road when I stopped for some rest. The back end of the trailer. I paused for a moment, and he spoke up. Well, what is it? Well, something tried to get into the trailer, and it killed one of the pigs. The farmer looked very confused, asking what road it was. I told him, Country Road 31 East for about 85 miles. All of a sudden, he had this look of fear come over him. I got a little curious and asked what the problem was. He finally spoke again, wondering if I heard or saw anything else. I replied with, Well, now that you mention it, I did hear this growl, 
sounded big, like from a bear or something. He did not seem okay with that answer. Well, friend, we haven't had bears in the area you drove for over 60 years. Now I was confused. He went on. There's a story, a legend really, that over a 200 mile radius, there are one or two Sasquatch and they use the area for hunting grounds. I chuckled a bit, but he looked at me like I was an idiot. He recommended I take my next load over the main highway to avoid another run-in. Thankfully, my next load was goats from his farm to another about 400 miles the other direction. The farmer loaded up the goats and I was on my way again, thinking about the old farmer's story and his warning to stay away from that country road. I scoffed and thought to myself he was just joking with me. I went ahead and stopped at the truck stop before the country road and had a late lunch. Might as well have been dinner. By the time I was done eating, it was getting dark. Not really thinking about it, I got back in the semi and started my way to my next stop. As I passed the sign saying I was starting on the country road, a feeling of dread came over me. But I kept on going. About 75 miles down the country road, my truck blew a tire. I had to pull to the side of the road to check out how bad it was. As an owner-operator, I was able to do most things needed when it came to my rig. I saw that the tire wasn't actually blown, it just had a nail in it. This was much better than a blowout. I went back to the cab and I started to look for my plug kit so I could fix the tire to get me back on the road. It was getting dark quick and colder and my plugs were too cold to use so I had to put them on the dash to warm them up first before using them. As I waited, I heard the goats bleeding and making some noise, so I reached under my seat for my pistol from when I was in the army. Nothing special, just a 45 caliber 1911 standard issue for servicemen. I got out of the truck and made my way to the rear, only to see the rear entrance had now been opened. In fact, one of the goats was halfway out, its throat torn out. I went into panic mode then, starting to look around, because it looked to me like I interrupted something trying to pull out that goat. At that moment, I heard the same growl again, but it was closer. It was so dark, I grabbed my flashlight, pointing it towards the sound. All I could see was a silhouette and yellow eyes. These eyes were almost seven and a half feet off the ground, though. I started to back up, and as I did, that silhouette stepped forward a bit, more into the light. And I tell you, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I never would have believed it. There it was, standing on two legs, what I could only call a Bigfoot, with blood dripping out of its mouth. I pulled my gun, pointing it at the creature. But then it stopped, like it knew what I was holding. It began to growl and snarl louder at me. I wanted to shoot, but I was horrified. Even with my gun drawn, I was walking backward. Then I had another thought. If I could make it to the cab of the semi-truck, I had a Polaroid camera, and I could take a picture. So I lowered my gun and walked even faster backwards. As I made it to the door, I heard the goats going crazy again. I opened the door, reaching for the camera, then I started to make my way back to the rear of the trailer. I stopped right before I got to the door, hearing the growling again in front of me. I pointed my flashlight with one hand, the camera with the other, and I snapped a photo. In an instant, I turned around and ran back to the cab of the truck, got in, and just drove away. I laid the photo down on the other seat and drove. I didn't care about the tire anymore or the goats in the back. I was in flight mode wanting to get to a safe place. I drove for over two hours straight before seeing lights from a gas station. I pulled in and slammed on the brakes. As I jumped out, the gas station attendant came out to me, asking what the rush was about. My face said it all, pure terror. He brought me inside and told me he'd have one of his mechanics fix the tire, which was now mostly torn up and on the rim. As I sat down inside, I noticed I'd grabbed the photo off the seat. I looked at it. At first, my eyes were dry and I didn't see anything. 
The attendant walked up behind me and said, Creepy, where'd you take that at? I looked at him in confusion, then wiped my face down with a wet washcloth. I looked again. I saw what he saw. Two big yellow glowing eyes. Almost looked like they were floating there in the dark. I called my next stop and told them my truck had broke down, and I wasn't able to make their delivery on time. He was a bit mad, but sent another driver to pick up the load. After I got off the phone with him, I walked on over to the shop. At that point, I just wanted to get home to my family. I had been driving for a while. Once there, the mechanic told me he put on a new tire, reminding me to take it easy next time. But when I looked at him, he just stopped talking and gave me the keys, apologizing. After about 18 hours behind the wheel, I finally made it home. I was greeted by my son and wife. I couldn't have felt happier to be farther away from that place. My son has always got in the truck to get my stuff and grab the photo too. He looked at it and was immediately creeped out. He asked where I took the picture, but I told him I'd tell him later. That's it for my grandpa's story. My dad told me that my grandpa would tell him the whole story when he was on his deathbed, only because he figured if he was dying then whatever he encountered should be dead by then too. I've never thought things like werewolves or Bigfoot were real, but my dad has never lied to me. He even showed me the picture. That photo was over 30 years old, and I could still make out the yellow eyes in it. It sent chills up my spine. I now know something like that is out there, and I never want to encounter it. Don't invite them in. From MJ Thom, 1. I'm a 56-year-old woman, married with four grown children, two dogs, and five cats. I'm living a decent, comfortable life now, but when this happened to me, I was 43. My husband was 44, my daughter 23, and her boyfriend 22. We all lived in a half-double. My best friend, who was 53, and her boyfriend lived right across the street, along with six other mutual friends. Their house was a half-double too, with the wall removed to create a whole big house. I'm explaining this because I want you to know how hectic it was within our two households. We were always over at each other's houses every day, partying non-stop. Each day when the guys went to work, my friend and I would drink our coffee in the morning, then switch to beer for the remainder of the day. When the guys came home, they would join us, and we would carry on into the night. We also indulged in some other substances. This was our daily routine. One night, my husband and my daughter went to pick up a friend of hers, so I was home alone. Everyone else was across the street. I decided to take the time to clean my room and listen to some CDs on my portable DVD player. As I'm humming along, the lights dimmed and I heard this sort of static. I noticed the static was coming from my DVD player. I went to check it out, and the static bursts from it again, only this time I hear something deeper in it, like a voice, a low voice. I was startled. I was all alone, buzzed, and now scared. I checked the cord, trying to find the cause, and I even put in a DVD to see if maybe it was the CD I was playing but it made that sound again with the voice. I couldn't understand what it said, but I knew it was saying something. My dresser was sat against the wall, and my bed was about three feet from it, with a headboard against an adjacent wall. When I heard that voice in static, I jumped up and turned to run out of my room. When I noticed that stretched out from the dresser drawer to the bed, I kid you not, was one of my lingerie teddies, as if someone was standing there holding it out in front of them. I froze, trying to comprehend what I was looking at. I continued to run out of my room, hoping I didn't fall down the stairs like they do in movies. I managed to get across the street, dragging my friend to my house and into my room. She was freaking out, she wasn't sure what she was about to see. I told her I needed someone else to witness this with me, and I didn't want to be left alone with that image in my head. As I studied the look on her face, wondering if she saw it, she proceeded to lift her leg and kick the teddy to the floor. That answered my question. 
we were both discussing what happened. We knew something was in there. I knew it would be useless to tell my husband because he didn't believe in that kind of stuff. Over the next couple of days, I could not sleep. I kept hearing unnatural noises. I swear they were meant for my ears alone because no one else ever heard anything. There were grunts, belches, the sound of someone passing gas, rumbling, squeaks, none of which were rats or mice or pets. One night, sitting on the floor while my husband was sleeping on the couch right behind me, my name was spoken directly into my ear. My heart basically stopped. Again, no one heard it but me. Then it graduated to visual torment. Every room I walked into, the lights would dim. Not flicker, but dim, like a shadow would simply stop over my head. I saw movement from the corner of my eye and red glowing light behind furniture. Even the plastic grocery bags had been made into sculptures of swans sitting on the shelves. One day I was outside looking up at the second floor window when I saw the curtains twisting around over and over like someone was caught up in them. But nobody was there, and no one else saw it, so I guess that was for my eyes only. I was eventually afraid to sleep. I couldn't be in the dark. I did as many drugs as I could that would keep me awake. Because of the shadows hanging over my head, I would have to have my husband stand guard at the bathroom door, with the door open so I could shower. I simply could not be alone. Then there came the flies. Cliché, right? Well, it happened. Our half-double had a dingy, dank, dark cement, brick, and stone basement that was the creepiest place ever. We made old hubby put a lock on that bad boy. The basement was divided weirdly into a few different rooms, creating a sort of tunnel on through to the other half of the double. One of the cubbies had some baby stuff being stored. We happened to notice there were flies, about 10 to 20 of them, flopping around that particular area. Bumbleflies, that's what I called them, because they were as big as bumblebees. We would kill them and there would be more every day. Soon, I had my last straw. We were cleaning out our garage and wouldn't you know it, in the rafters we found a freaking satanic bible. Another cliche, I guess. I thought, nope, not in my house. I don't mess with demons or the devil or any other cultist stuff. I was convinced that our drinking, drug use, and partying had opened a door, and me and all our friends unknowingly invited that evil torment. It was trying to drive me crazy. We built a fire in our fire pit out back, ripping out the pages and burning them. Now I gotta tell you, they burned, but weirdly. They sort of glowed. The embers of the ash stayed glowing, even floating in the air way too long before burning out and falling to the ground. I swear I thought it was going to float up to the roof and burn my house down. When we threw the last page in, the cover, it burned, and it burned good. But what we saw next was enough to make us get our house blessed. The cover of that book had an outline of the devil on it, in shadow against a red background. That page floated up into the air on fire, then burned out, leaving the literal glow of that same outline of the devil. This time, not just me, but all of us were frozen and freaked out. I called my sister. She's not ordained or professional or anything like that, but she does have her faith. She's a very devout Christian and studies the Bible, so I was satisfied with having her help. We went from room to room, saying specific prayers to shoo the devil or demons away. I'm not sure if it worked, but at the very least, it gave me some confidence that God was here. Even if the devil was here too, God was keeping him at bay. It took me a long while to be able to turn off the lights when I slept, and still I used the TV for a nightlight. I've since quit drinking and doing drugs. I'm convinced that when you alter your mind, you weaken the walls that keep out evil, and that evil wants to destroy us. Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs. Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app, or follow me on Twitter at darkprevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, 
be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.